Hello, good afternoon and welcome to everybody uh, in, in Bulgaria. This is Anne, Anne Robinson, and I'm speaking to you from Santander in the north of Spain, which is where I'm based. So today um, I'm going to be talking about e exam preparation in the real world. Um, but I was saying to you just before we started now that I'm hoping that uh, the ideas I'm going to be sharing will be relevant to you, even if you're not preparing your students for an exam uh, or very, very soon anyway, um, and be relevant for you for other levels as well as B2, which is what um, the level that I've chosen to focus on today. But I'm hoping that you'll find the ideas relevant and interesting for you and your situation. Uh, I think you've already had this in other webinars, but just to uh, reiterate, I'll be asking you some questions uh, during the webinar, asking you for your ideas. So if you can type those into the chat box and, and then we can uh, see them, it'll be great. At the end of the webinar, you'll be, complete a survey and then you get your, uh, you'll get your certificate if you do. And next week, um, I'll be, we'll be sending you some handouts. So, a couple of things I'll be showing on the slides. And I'll also uh, create a handout with some of the ideas to explain them further, because sometimes on the slide, the information is quite um, concise and bullet points and things like that. So sometimes I like to give you uh, some more explanation or guidance, perhaps. OK, so that will be coming to you next week. So we're going to start with my B2 exam journey. OK, and um, this is a memory that I'm going to share with you. So um, I was teaching in Madrid and I'd been teaching, I think, for this is my second year of teaching. Um, and the language school where I was working said, um, right, this year we're going to give you a group of what well, it was first certificate at that, that point. It was called first certificate. Um, and I had this lovely group of students. Um, and they were all aiming to take the exam in June. We were starting in October. So that first memory. So the students I had in my class, in my classroom, had all been level tested or perhaps they'd been at the, the language school the year before. So they uh, had done like the previous level, as it were, and were coming up to B2 first. Or if they were new to the language school, they'd done a level test and they'd been placed in this group and potentially had um, the level to take the exam. And me, uh, having been given this group before I started teaching them, I obviously found out as much as I could about the exam. In those days, actually, there wasn't that much information available. There were books of practice tests, there were course books, but we didn't have the whole range of wonderful materials that we, we can find nowadays, either on the Cambridge University Press website or the uh, Cambridge uh, Assessment website. There's so much more available. But in those days, yeah, I could have a look at a, a, an exam. I could think about what was on it. And I had a course book to prepare for it as well. But like any group, students came with from different backgrounds. They were different ages. It was a language school, so they weren't all the same age. They'd learnt English in different ways and perhaps had been learning English for different lengths of time. Like any class, which I'm sure you would agree, they came with their own strengths and their own weaknesses. So they were perhaps, some of them were good at listening, but they were weak at reading or vice versa. They had their own preferences for things they liked or didn't like doing. And they also had their own reasons for taking this exam. Perhaps in some cases because their parents had said you need to do it. Or in other cases, it was them, the students themselves uh, who had decided to take the exam. Um, interestingly, very often when you get an exam group, Sometimes you get students at the start of the uh, school year say, oh, no, no, I don't want to do this exam. And in the same classroom, you'll get students who say, I want to do the exam. And then when it comes to actually enroll for the exam, perhaps they pull out and don't take it. Okay. 
So in my case, students could choose to take it or not. And as I say, if they committed themselves at the beginning of the year, sometimes that changed during the year. OK, so I think a typical class. So what I'm hoping to show with uh, share with you today is my journey since that first B2 first exam class that I had. I'm hoping to sh uh, share with you some of the insights that I've picked up uh, during over the years, either through my own observation, through more material becoming available, through attending training sessions, but also very much, I think, sharing ideas with, with teachers uh, in seminars and in webinars like this. OK, so and also I'm hoping that to help to give you some uh, ideas, activities and insights into teaching and reaching all of the students in your classroom. OK, no matter what their previous learning experiences or their preferences is. So a question for you. Um, how can we find out as teachers about our students? Uh, at the start of the year, how they feel, what they expect out of this class, how they feel about English, how they feel about taking the exam. Is there anything that they're afraid of? How can we do that? Yeah, so any suggestions? Yes, survey, simply ask, talk, right? Tests, OK, well, these students have been tested. Polls, yes, we could do a poll. OK, right, so I agree. We can just say, how do you feel? OK, um, what I find works very well is writing a letter to my students and asking them to write back to me. So this is something I often do at the beginning of a training course as well these days. Um, so I write to the students and they write back to me. And the, the, the thing I like about this is I don't have to rely on my memory. So if I talk to them and especially if it's a big group, I might not remember what everybody in the group has said. And also students might feel perhaps shy or reluctant to share their feelings, especially maybe their negative feelings. So what I find is by writing them a letter and asking them to write back to me, I can take those letters and keep them. OK, we could even come back to them at the end of the year or halfway through the year and say, remember, you said you were worried about listening and look. Look at the last listening do you, that you did. Look at those results. You did brilliantly. OK, so writing them a letter and getting them to write back is a great idea, I think. And I also do this. I don't give it as homework for them to take home. I would ask them to do it in class. Now, the reason I'd ask them to do it in class is it's also interesting for me as a teacher, and if we're thinking about something like level B2 first, to see them uh, actually writing. So what's their expression? Is it positive? Perhaps you've got somebody in the class who hates writing and that might show on their face or it might show in their posture. You can also tell how quickly they write, whether they think about what they're going to write before they actually write down their ideas or their answers. So you can see if you've got any planners in the classroom or you've got those students who don't think and don't plan, but just leap into writing straight away. So it's all, I think, very useful information for you to get the actual information that they write, but also seeing them in action and writing, I find is very good and very useful. OK, so many of you, I think, have recently switched to online teaching. So perhaps this would also be a good moment to ask them how they feel about having online classes. So 
things that are very important to find out. How fast an internet connection do they have? Can they still attend if your class is three to four in the afternoon? Can all the students in the group actually connect at that time? Perhaps there aren't very many computers in their class, in their home, I should say. And perhaps they can't attend the class live. So maybe for some, some of those students, you might have to send them things to do and they can send them back. Another very important thing, has their computer got a camera? And something that quite a lot of teachers are commenting on is that uh, these are, I'm thinking of uh, countries where perhaps they've been teaching on, online for quite a few weeks now. Uh, Italy and Greece, I've heard quite a few comments that students are suddenly becoming a bit reluctant to switch on their cameras. Very often they're in, in the online classroom, they're in class with you, but they're starting to get a bit, oh, I don't, I'm going to switch my camera off. Um, I, suggestions are that this might be because they're multitasking, so they're not giving their full attention to the class, but it could be for a host of other reasons. It could be that um, their hair's a mess. They feel as though I, I, you know, I didn't have a shower or I don't look good today. It could be because somebody in their family is doing something or on the phone or speaking and they don't want that to be heard. So there could be lots of reasons. So apart from these three questions that I have put on the slide, what other question questions do you think it would be useful to ask your students about their online classes? Can you type your uh, uh, suggestions into the type uh, chat box, please? The device they're using, yes, good point. How do you feel? Yeah. And again, how do you feel it might be something that um, you'd want to send privately to students? Yeah, can they use the apps? Uh, perhaps you've sent them something and they're very embarrassed because they don't know how to use it. A very good point. And I know in the UK, teachers are also commenting that perhaps uh, their students are, are great with apps but they're not very good at uh, spreadsheets or Excel documents or Word documents. Yeah, and so they're saying that, we, that perhaps we've gone to the wow wow technology, but maybe our students also need the basics. So again, you know, how, how comfortable, uh, how confident do you feel with the, um, the apps, but also with um, perhaps the documents PDFs? Yeah, can they open the PDFs? Have they got, you know, the the things they need on our computer to do this. OK, so um, we don't just we can use a letter at the start of the year. I would certainly uh, recommend doing this now with your online um, classes and finding out about it. Um, and uh, again, you could do this even you are when you go back into the classroom. Perhaps, you know, you're coming up to enrollment for the exam. So again, you could send them a letter and just say, how are you feeling about the exam? Uh, how are you feeling about the reading? How are you feeling about the listening? And just finding out how they're feeling at different points in the year, I think is, is very important. But right now, you know, how is the online experience going? Okay. Um, I'm not sure how big your screen is here, okay? But this is one of the things I mentioned that I'm going to send to you. So I created a couple of years ago a board game. This was obviously uh, for the physical classroom, OK, but you could certainly use it digitally now if you're online. So it's got six uh, squares across and six squares going down. And the idea is that you take a dice. Yeah, uh, you could have an online dice. There are online dice available and you throw the dice two times. So if I were to throw a five and then a three, I would have to describe my handwriting. So my handwriting is pretty average in size. Um, it's pretty neat, except when I'm perhaps tired or I need to write very quickly. 
I don't do as much handwriting now as I used to, like everybody. Uh, so sometimes it, my hand aches when I've been handwriting for a while. OK, so these are questions um, with the relation relation to the exam. For example, if I throw in a one and a one, why are you taking this exam? But they're also getting them to think about their real world. How fast can you type? If they're going to um, type, if they're going to do a computer based exam, how fast can they type? Or if you're doing online lessons, that's another important thing. How fast can your students type? Because some students might finish very quickly or type in their answers because they can um, type very quickly, whereas others might be slower. So I'll send you this as a PDF document for you to use. Um, and as I say, you could um, adapt it for non-exam classes too. Okay, so um, I we sent you or most of you a text yesterday, a reading text, and it was taken from Open World B2 first. And we're going to take it as an example of how we can combine exam preparation and also preparation for the real world or to see its relevance for the real world. So the text that I've um, that I, I I'm going to base this uh, session on, or at least part of it, is taken from Unit 10 of Open World B2, and it uh, it's a it's from the Reading and Use of English paper. It's a Part Five reading, and the theme, if you have the uh, text, is the thrill of extreme sports. OK, and you can see uh, I've given you the two um, parts of the map for that unit. So you can see we're working on all the different skills. So all the different parts of B2 first here. We've got a grammar focus uh, or two grammar focuses. In fact, uh, causatives, ed, ed and ing adjectives. And then we've also got some vocabulary work and we've got a real world section which connects their learning with the real world, which appears at the end of every unit. So this is the text. OK, so if you didn't get the text, OK, uh, this is the text that we're going to be using. OK. I just made my screen busy, bigger so that I can see it better. <laughs> OK, so extreme sports. OK, um, and you can see it's quite a jazzy text. We've got uh, the first paragraph in white font and then we change to black font. OK, so let's look at this text. Uh, yeah, no, we'll, we'll go to the next. So this text works on reading and uh, use of English part five. And as you can see on this screen, it's a training uh, exercise. OK, so it's not a, a full blown exam exercise. Some people were saying, I think quite a lot of people said perhaps it would be quite easy for their students. Um, I don't know whether I, I think it's I think it's a it's a good B2 uh, first text myself okay however um we have got guidance here we've got training to be able to answer the different kinds of questions so um before they read the text okay they get two questions uh, to look at so they've got the first question why does the writer mention alan eustace and his skydive so this is the purpose of function question. And we've got uh, four options like they would get in the exam. And we've got guidance. And I love this guidance. I think it's really useful. So they're getting them to, first of all, find Alan Eustace in the text, because that's where they're going to find uh, this, the answer to this question. And then in the box, we've got uh, the questions to guide them to find and choose the right option. 
Um, and I think this is wonderful because these are the kind of questions that our students need to be asking themselves. Yeah, so for option B, to describe a typical fan of extreme sports, does the writer suggest that Alan Eustace is a fan of extreme sports? So they can go and check and know he does ex an extreme sport, but he's, it doesn't say, and it must say in the text, that he's a fan of them. He probably is, but it doesn't say it in the text. Then we have question two, and this is uh, um, testing understanding of detail, which again could be one, will be, I'm sure, one of the question focuses for this part. And there, it, it tells them another useful tip, underline the sentences in the second paragraph of the article. So again, we're guiding them to the right part of the article and they're giving them a, a, a very useful tip, underline. So if they can't underline in the text, the answer the, or the match to the option, then it's not the right answer. It's not the right option. So a very useful tip and training. Then after uh, they've done one and two, they would um, do some other questions. Who does they refer to? Uh, so reference. And four, uh, we've got understanding again detail. And five, we've got a typical uh, question where they have to have read and understood really the, the whole text. And very often there's a change or there's a summary in the final paragraph, which they have to understand. OK. Now, this is not the first time that uh, students will have um, approached uh, and had training for um, a reading part five task. So in unit three, they already practiced this. And they already had these exam facts and exam tips. OK, and I think there's a very useful tip here. Read the quest, the text quickly to get a better idea of what it's about. Very useful tip there. So in your experiences, experience, do your students very often start answering the first question immediately without having read the whole text. Does that happen? I like that. It does, but we work against it. Well, keep working against it. Okay. Because unfortunately, um, for some reason, I don't know whether it's uh, their previous learning experience or I suppose it's just um, we want to get things done. Uh, so we we tend to leap into um, completing a task before we've got the whole picture. So some uh, tips for me for um, getting your students to read the whole text. Well, first of all, in class, I would definitely get them to cover up the questions. Um, or if I was giving them uh, a text, if I could physically give them a text, I wouldn't even give them the questions. Obviously, in your course book, they probably will have the questions that go with the text. So uh, activities, OK? And I think the first one's a very useful activity. So say, so, right, get your watch, get your clock or get your phone, time yourself. How long does it take you to read the whole text? And with this text, which is a B2 first level text, you'd probably be talking uh, your quickest students might take a minute, minute, 10 seconds. And other students might take about two minutes or longer even perhaps. The, the students who've read the, quest, the, the text very quickly are not necessarily the ones that you think, wow, well done, because 
perhaps they've read it very quickly, but they haven't really taken very much information into it in, in. But I think it's also very useful just to know how long does it take you to read a text? For me, that's also very valuable training. Because if in the whole exam, I know I'm going to be short of time because everybody is in paper one of B2 first. If I know that, well, two minutes is reading the text, then I know how long I've got to answer the questions. And do this with the different kinds of texts too, the one the different kinds that they'll get in the exam, because some of the texts will take them longer. This one, I think they should take perhaps longer because they have to understand more detail than um, perhaps the other texts. But do the same with the gapped text when they have to put sentences back into the text. Again, get them, train them to read the whole text and time themselves. How long does it take me to read it? Another thing I like to do is say, re read the text and then say, what tenses were in the text? Or perhaps you could do before they read the text. You're going to read a text, read the text and just read it and think and look at the verbs. And what tenses are they in? Because very often, for example, in a story, you might get a time shift and the tenses will change depending on the part of the st story that we're at. Do you have any ideas and suggestions to share with, uh, with us of getting students to read the whole text, apart from how long or tenses? How could we get them to read the whole text before they start answering? So Svetlana, you're saying make a guess, but what, what would they be guessing? Look for key words. Mm -hmm. About the content. Yes, yes, I, that's a good point. They could, uh, they could take the title and uh, predict what they think they might going to be going to find and then see if they uh, find it, find it. Blocking words from the text, okay. Ask them something in the text, something that they think is there, but is actually not. Good point. Yes, I like that's a good point, actually. Yeah, you can get them to predict what they think they will and what they think they won't find in a text and get them to check. Good idea. What the text is not about and give some options. Yes, good. Another one, another thing, for example, with the text that I sent you or I just showed on the screen, there are several different sports are mentioned. So you could get them to read and count how many sports are mentioned or how many people, how many people's names they get. Or you would give them there are these people are in the text. Who are they? And they have to read the text, especially when we've got a text with various, perhaps pe different people giving their opinions. Then they could, uh, well, that one is a doctor and that one's an expert and that one's a teacher. OK, so you could read the text and find out who these people are. OK, so when you're getting them to read a text, if you set, um, set a, a task, set for them something to do, that I think will help them and encourage them to read the whole text. And just to mention, um, Cambridge in the uh, Cambridge exams, if the text is printed before the questions, then that the advice is read the text first. But for example, in the final part of the reading and use of English paper, the questions are actually be printed before the text. So you read the questions or at least some of the questions before you read the text to find the answer. OK, so it's a very good uh, guide to what they should do first, the way that it's actually printed. OK, so we had uh, the training. We had the uh, extreme uh, sports uh, text was the training. I mentioned we'd had some facts and some tips in a previous unit. And then wherever a task is focused on in open world, we also have a practice ta uh, task. 
So in this case, we've got six questions, which is what we would have in the exam. We only had five in the training task with the extreme sports. So we get the six questions and we'll get the typical range of questions that you would get in the exam as well. And then, uh, because this is the second time they're focusing on this task, they would, uh, they, they would then check, do they know what uh, the important things to know about this part of the exam? So in this case, they have to decide if the sentences are true and, or false. So are there six questions? Yes. Each of which has three answer options? No, there are four options for the answers. OK, so a quick check. Do they know uh, now what they're going to find in this part of the exam? In the teacher's book, OK, you also get guidance. Um, so, so we've got six, four option, multiple choice, and we've got the range of possible question focuses that they could get in this part of the exam. So you can see they've got lots of help to prepare for uh, this particular task and all the tasks that could be appear on the B2 first exam. OK, so I. My feeling is I'm not too worried about the exam preparation if I'm using this particular book because it's got lots of things and lots of really useful things to prepare students for the exam. So, what I'd like to move on now is how does uh, doing this task or reading these kind of texts, how does it relate to real life? So, I'm going to be referring now to life competencies. I don't know whether any of the previous webinars have mentioned these. OK, but uh, the life competencies that I'm going to focus on come from the Cambridge Framework of Life Competencies, which you can find on the word, World of Butter Learning. Um, and I just wanted to point out that, in my opinion, this reading um, part five will develop, I can develop very useful skills or competencies. So. Distinguishing between fact and opinion. Very often there are questions about the writer's opinion. And I think um, being, under, being able to understand what is a fact and what is somebody's opinion, but perhaps isn't a fact, is a really useful real life skill. So if you think of fake news, or if somebody pretends to be an expert and gives their opinion, it's very important to know that that is somebody's opinion, but it's not a fact, or that fake news is not true. So I think we can help to develop the, uh, skills to deal with those situations by using these kind of texts. Distinguishing between the main idea and then perhaps other things which have uh, build up an argument. So if you think of an essay, very often we'll be talking about perhaps one main idea, but we can add uh, other ideas to support our opinion. Uh, to understand the basic structure of an argument. So this, I think, is very important to read the whole text. So does it start and then keep in the same time frame? Does it move backwards and forwards? Uh, does it, is it consistent? I think all of these things are useful skills uh, and to develop. And uh, from learning to learn, so one of the possible task focuses, uh, sorry, question focuses could be, uh, why does the writer use the word uh, clue uh, on line 29? Um, um, and perhaps, well, clue is not a very good clue, actually. Uh, let's think of um, high, high profile, for example, is something I'm going to look at. Uh, and perhaps your students might stop and say, oh, what does that word mean? But hopefully they can use the words around it in order to be able to understand new words or unfamiliar words. I think in our first language, it's something we're not uh, conscious of doing. 
but we do do it. You, we still keep learning words in our own language, but perhaps we never remember when we were a child, perhaps, and working out something that we were hearing, perhaps our parents discussing, and you were you were thinking about it. But nowadays, I think in our own language, we don't really think and analyze too much. So I think these are very useful life competencies. OK, I'm going to share a few activities and uh, this I'll be sending you on a handout so that you've got them. OK, and um, but for any reading text. OK, so um, any reading text doesn't have to be an exam reading text, any text. So um, inevitably, our students are going to find some texts or some parts of text more difficult than others. In an exam, they have no choice. They have to read the text that they're reading. But in real life, they might have to read something for their studies or for their work. And again, they might, it might be difficult to understand. So I think talking about what you found difficult to understand and why can really help. Perhaps everybody in the class found a particular text or a particular part really difficult. Perhaps you as a teacher can say to them, yes, you're right. It was it was quite difficult, wasn't it, that text? Get them to think about how they how much they like it, but just instead of just saying, do you like this text? And they'll say yes or no. But perhaps if it was in a text in a magazine, an online magazine or a web page, would they read it? Give it a score and our students are very used to uh, rating things nowadays, things that they've uh, experienced or bought and they give it stars. So why not apply that to reading texts? Perhaps they don't like it, but perhaps uh, they could they might say, well, my dad would like to read this or my cousin or my neighbor or my teacher. OK, so understanding that you might not uh, be motivated to read this text, but you can understand that somebody else might be. OK, and empathy, I think, is very important too. Talking about language, they can choose their favorite words or their sentence or their paragraph and say why they liked it. OK, and they can share their favorite words. Perhaps at this point they might teach each other some new words. And what other titles could this text have? OK, uh, find there's no photo with his actual text. There are photos just before it, but there's no photo for this particular text. So which photo could go with this text? Or perhaps they could have more than one photograph to go with the text. And that is really showing their understanding in the, in the case of titles. It's the global understanding. And with the photos, especially if we ask them to find more than one photo, it could be uh, understanding the different sports and the different people who are mentioned in this text. So I have a handout yeah, um, that I'll be sending you with these ideas and more. In relation to the questions, we can do exactly the same. Which question was easier? And I'd always start with the easiest ones, actually, um, to encourage them. Uh, to think about, well, that one was easy. Before I go on to the negative, that one was difficult and why it might have been difficult. Also, I think it's very important to tell your students to reassure them that in the Cambridge exams, in each part, there will be questions that will be easier because perhaps there's one B1 question on the B2 first exam. And there's also going to be some questions that will become from C1 because we are testing below and above B2 level two. So if your students do exceptionally well um, and get into the next level on the Cambridge scale, then they could be issued a certificate which says that they have demonstrated ability at C1 level. So there are some questions on the B2 first exam which are C1 level. So if they're more difficult, they perhaps could be the C1 questions. In the In One World, um, another thing that I love, and I think this is quite uh, novel, 
um, there is a section in each unit to push students. So language that really comes from C1 level. Um, and in this case, we have cleft sentences to uh, change the order or change the emphasis of a sentence that students can do. So you could do this as a whole class activity or perhaps with students um, who finish early and perhaps uh, could be want to be pushed further. So uh, if you haven't had the text, I've got it on the screen and I hope it's big enough. Can you see in this text Right at the start of that paragraph and on line 29, can you see there are two cleft sentences? Can you see them? So we've got, it was this question that prompted researchers Eric Breimer and Lindsay Oates. So this question is referring back to the previous paragraph, but it's also shedding an emphasis, putting an emphasis on the fact that Eric Breimer and Lindsay Odes decided to conduct a research study because of that. So it, it, it emphasizes it by changing the, um, the order of the information. Um, and then line 29, one of the conclusions they drew was, okay, uh, so again, we are um, emphasizing the conclusion that is coming next. Okay, so this is a very useful way of um, focusing on important information and taking your reader through a text. Okay, so uh, get students to spot these things when they're reading. Okay, this will help them with their reading and it will really help them with a gapped text task in B2 first. OK, so now I'm going to show you some pictures and uh, the, the this is actually before the reading text that I sent you or that I've just shown you. So they've got a little questionnaire. First of all, they match these sports with the pictures. So we've got some vocabulary input checking which ones they do and don't know. And then they complete the questionnaire. Then they talk about it with um, with a partner. OK, and what I really liked um, is that instead of having would you ever, yes, possibly no, we've got some lovely idioms. Not in a million years. I'd never do that. Where do I sign? Give me the form. I'm going to sign up right now. I like I love the language that they're using there to to answer or choose their answers because it's real life language. OK, so when I uh, looked at that questionnaire myself, I thought, what's absorbing? So I've seen that activity that we can see in uh, picture one there. I've seen it, but I didn't know the name for it. So I'm a trained, curious person. So what did I do? I went to find out more about it. So what I'm going to do now is uh, just show some activities that you could do. Uh, I've chosen the questionnaire and I've chosen the text on the extreme sports and to think about where we could go next. And again, I've gone back to the Cambridge framework of life competencies and looked at different areas. And the ones we're going to look at now are all, all appear in other units of One World B2 first. OK, so we could analyze ideas and make decisions. So this is from another unit, unit 12. And it's asking them to research a famous festival, create a poster, and then present it to their classmates. And then they decide as a class which festival they would prefer to go to. So could we adapt this for the extreme sports, do you think? Could we get them to go online and research and make a poster?
Yes, good. I'm glad you agree. OK, so this is how I adapted it. OK, just very um, slight word changes. And also, I've also given them a choice of how they can present their findings. So as well as creating a poster, they could create, especially if you're teaching online, a slideshow. They could make a video or they could give a presentation um, you know, speaking about what they, they, they found. And then as a class, they could decide which of the extreme sports they would like to go and try. I went to find out more about Zorbing and I noticed some of you had typed into the chat box that it's very popular in New Zealand. And yes, it started in New Zealand in the mid 1990s, I discovered. OK, so this is what your students could be finding out uh, more about these sports. And uh, it's also possible if you're looking where to Zorb, where to go Zorbing, you can go online and of course you get uh, opinions of people who've been there. Okay, so uh, again, your students could explore and maybe choose the best organization to go Zorbing with. When I did my research, I also got this on my screen. So thinking of your students and perhaps different students in the same group, which areas do you think your students might like to explore? So would they like to find out if they're dangerous or how much they cost? Or can you breathe? How do they work? Yeah, so I'm sure you've got different students with different interests uh, in your group. OK, so perhaps they could work on and find out about different things uh, like these questions people also ask. So again, from another unit. And I've already adapted it for this unit for this text. Working groups, they go online, they find out what they need, how much Zorb balls cost and where you can buy them. And they find out, so they might come back from with different uh, websites, perhaps, um, who can get the be best deals. Yeah, so who got the cheapest Zorb ball? Or perhaps you got a cheap Zorb ball, but the reviews of those Zorb balls aren't very good. So perhaps it's better to spend a bit more money. Okay, I think a real life skill. Sorry. Understanding issues. OK, so issues, if you're going to do this sport or if you're going to organize a trip, then it's very important to know about the risks. So what are the risks involved in zorbing or hang gliding or bungee jumping? What are the risks? What equipment? What safety precautions do you need to take? And I think the man, the Alan that we read about in the text, he would have done a lot of research before he went off to break his record and do his um, his extreme sport. Can you do extreme sports where you are? Yes, which ones? Have you done any? Bungee jumping? Okay. <laughs> you wouldn't go for any, Madhuri. Okay, right. I typed this into a search engine, and you're putting some uh, some extreme sports there in the chat box. Which do you think would come first in my search results? OK, these are two of the results I got and they were on my first results page. And I got cliff climbing uh, and then in the second one I got quite a lot, uh, including bungee jumping and one that somebody mentioned before we started the webinar actually, base jumping. 
which I have no idea what it is, and I will find out after the webinar. <laughs> Thank you for raising that. Okay, uh, so again, from another unit, uh, go online and search for an extreme sport, and then invite each other to come along and try these uh, extreme sports with you. OK, so very much your students can research these things, especially the ages, age groups that you were saying um, before the webinar started that you're, you're teaching. Uh, your teenagers and your early 20 year olds uh, can find content and then share it. Um, and I think they'll be very motivated to do it. So I wanted to practice again high profile, which was in that text. So do you recognize these high profile skydivers or perhaps you can see their names in the link at the bottom of the screen? <laughs> OK, so we've got Tom Cruise and this the guy in the blue suit there is the person who does, does interviews. Yeah, he's, he presents the late night show. And his name is James Corden. He's originally from the UK, but he now is based in Los Angeles. And uh, I saw somebody say, this is hilarious. It really is. It's, um, it's the program when John Tom Cruise challenges him to go on this uh, skydiving. And you actually see the build up and them actually do it. Um, and it's brilliant, okay? so. I, I thought immediately thought of this when I was preparing this webinar uh, because um, it's such a funny uh, video and I think your students would love it too. And I also discovered uh, that there is a song called Zorbing. So you could get your students to predict, as we were saying, you can get them to predict what they think will be in a text and perhaps won't be in a text. So in a song which has the name Zorbing, what do you think the song will be like? Will the music be fast or slow? And what will we see in the video for the song? OK, so again, you could get your students to go off and uh, listen to the song or and watch the video for the song and come back and say, well, Yes, it's a great title for the song because hmm? do you think the singers will be rolling, uh, rolling around in a Zorb ball on the video? OK, I encourage you to go and um, go and watch this song video too, OK, and see what you think. So as well as um, exam preparation and uh, all of the other things that we saw on the map uh, that I showed you for this unit, in each of the unit, there is a, a section, two pages called real world English. So this is not really exam focused. It obviously will help them as well with the exam, but it's English that they could um, find useful if they're traveling or perhaps contacting um, a firm or a web page or something. Um, yeah, so your card payment was successful is something they could get on a website. OK, so we've got these this section in each unit of One World on real world English. OK, so I think the connection with real world, the real world is very well established in One World. OK, and I think a real life skill that I like to um, use myself. OK, so before I connected today, I was just thinking through my webinar and I was thinking uh, that I hoped it was going to be a good webinar and I was thinking through the steps to the webinar. So right now I'm going to uh, share with you an activity that I do with students for them to visualize success. OK, so I just want you to listen. Um, and I'm going to just speak to you. OK, so are you sitting comfortably? 
Are your hands empty? Take your fingers off your keyboard. Put your pens down. Just listen and visualize. You may found, find it easier if you close your eyes. Are you ready? Let's visualize success. You're taking B2 first. Right now, you're in the exam room. You arrived on time. You remembered to take your ID, your clear bottle of water, everything you need. The examiner puts your question paper on your desk. You look at the question paper at the front. You read through the instructions. The examiner also puts your answer sheet on the desk. You check your name. It's correct. The exam starts. You open the reading and use of English question booklet. You pick up your pencil. No, wait, you remember that you should read through the text first. So you put down your pencil and you read the whole text. You do this through the whole paper. You transfer your answers to the answer sheet at the end of every part. You finish the test. You checked your answers. You've answered all the questions. Even that one question that you weren't 100% sure about. The examiner tells everyone to stop writing. You leave your paper on the desk. You stand up and you leave the room. And you feel great. Give yourself a high five. How do you feel? You feel like this man here in the photo? Okay, so get your students to visualize success, take them through the steps, what will happen on exam day and take them through it step by step so that they visualize it and they'll feel more positive and optimistic about their exam experience. This is a real life skill that sports people, athletes do all the time. And again, your students could find somebody that they really admire and find out how they prepare for big events. OK, so do something like this with your students. And again, I can share this this um, visualizing success activity with you in the handout. So. That's. It's from me in terms of sharing activities, but I'd like to hope that we have time for some questions if you have any. And I hope you've enjoyed the activities. We're going lots of thanks. Any questions? Um, I'll just show you because perhaps people might be leaving the room. That is my web page, and you can contact me via my web page if you'd like to uh, contact, contact me about anything. And it's also where I share activities like the ones we've been doing today. Okay. So please come by and visit me and keep in touch. And I hope to be back in Bulgaria very soon in person and to actually meet up with you in person. <laughs>